Today I'd like to look at the 100 block of Huron Avenue on the west side of the street. That's the first block north of Military Street Bridge. We looked at this block in videos 27 and 28, but since that time I've come up with more photographs and information that I thought you might enjoy seeing. Today that block looks like this. We can see that uh, facing Huron Avenue that block is void of buildings. Not much different than it was in 1867. At that time, that block was also void of buildings. That bridge you see there is a military street bridge. And this photograph here, which was taken 10 years earlier, uh, you can see the vacant lot on the left. That would be the 100 block of Huron Avenue. And this photograph taken uh, a couple years later, you can see that it's the same bridge and the same surrounding buildings, but in the 100 block of uh, Huron Avenue, you see there's a building there now. This building was built by John Howard of the uh, lumber company, Howard and Son. And you can see uh, on the signage up above that part of that building at least was uh, used for a fruit house. Also, this building would be enlarged later on, about the 1900s. Uh, you'll see a picture of that shortly, but if you look at this uh, building here, you can see it squares off on the edges on the south side. Eventually, it would have a curve around on the south side. We'll see that in a minute. One of the first retail establishments to occupy that building was E.R. Sweetser. And what kind of store was this? Well, let's take a look. Challenge brand of black alpaca and brilliantine superior to any other make yet introduced for sale only at Sweetser. Medicated shaker flannel, dead shot for rheumatism, for sale at Sweetser's. Mrs. S.A. Moody's patent self-adjusting abdominal corsets for sale at Sweetser's. All wool yard, wide French merino, only 62 and a half cents. All wool sateen, only 50 cents for sale at Sweetser's. Ladies, black alpaca dresses, waterproof cloaks, velveteen and beaver jackets for sale cheap at Sweetser's. Good waterproof, only 75 cents. Diagonal waterproofs and waterproofs in all new shades for sale cheap at, where else? Sweetser's. Well, Mr. Sweetser must not have been too successful as he went bankrupt. And uh, a couple of fellows came along, uh, actually three, by the name of Johnston, Bondi, and Howard. And they opened up their own store after buying the bankrupt stock out uh, as Howard, Bondi, and Company. Johnson's name wasn't on there yet, but it would be later. The three-way partnership was dissolved when Mr. Howard retired. The store then went by the name of Bondi and Johnston. And this photograph here, where you see the collision between the steamer Burlington and the barge H.F. Church that collided at the Military Street Swing Bridge. Uh, you can see the Bondi and Johnson signage on the side of the building. You can also see that there's been no addition put on there yet. And of course, uh, in this uh, photograph here, it says 1890. But in this photograph, the same collision, it says 1885. So sometimes you have to be flexible with these dates. This is a great photograph of the uh, Bondi and Johnston building. And you can see the building is larger now. Uh, that area that has the three windows to the left-hand side that's all new, that would be the addition. And you can see it's no longer squared off on the southern end, it goes off a little bit on an angle. I found an interesting article that uh, Dorothy Mitz wrote in her Times Herald articles, Where the Wild Goose Flies. And it says this, J.L. Hudson store based on local merchant stock. So what did uh, Bondi and Johnston have to do with J.L. Hudson? Well, she goes on to say this. In 1881, J.L. Hudson left his job as a clerk in the nationally famed C.R. Mabley department store. They're going to business for himself. 
and open a clothing store for men and boys in the old Detroit Opera House. Six years later, he moved his business to a new building on the corner of Farmer and Gratiot. And to the surprise of the public, which doubted that such a business would succeed off Woodward Avenue. But the store did succeed under Hudson's management and crew until it spread upward and outward, covering an entire block with a Woodward Avenue frontage and eventually reaching two floors below ground and more than 20 stories above. In the meantime, after he began to expand his new location, Hudson decided to emulate Babley's plan of a store and add several new departments, including a dry goods department. At this juncture, a change had also been made in Port Huron Pioneer Firm of Bondi and Johnston, a two-story clothing and dry goods store on the west side of Huron Avenue at the Military Street Bridge and adjacent to Black River. The same brick block, which is the site of Full Moon Records Shop, Glasses General Store, My Place, Fanny Farmer Candies, and Fox's Jewelers. This was written in 1981. For some time, William Johnson, a tailor by trade, had been desirous of going into men's clothing business exclusively. After Bondi's death, Johnson sold the firm's dry goods stock to J.L. Hudson. How the two happened to come together in the transaction seems not to have been recorded, but both, as well as Bondi, had earlier been residents of Canada, in and near Hamilton, Ontario, and may have been friends in that country. In any event, Johnson's entire stock of dry goods formed the nucleus of Hudson's new dry goods department. So I thought that was an interesting tidbit to share. There were other offices and uh, businesses that were on the second floor above Bondi and Johnston, but I won't go into those because I, I've covered this block before in videos 27 and 28, so I'm trying not to repeat myself. But in this ad uh, for Schoolcraft real, uh, real Estate, you can see at the very bottom of this ad, it says office over William Johnston's clothing store. This would have been after his partner died and he had the business to himself. And uh, this was uh, in 1894. Johnson's business lasted about five or six years. And then uh, it was taken over by Johnny Wolfstein and company. You can see his ad here. And he kept pretty much the same uh, type of store that uh, Johnston had, and that was a men's store. And here's a couple of postcards, this one being in black and white uh, that shows the Wolfstein uh, signage on the side of the building. And this one here has been colored in, but the same photograph actually. This photograph gives you a very good look at the building. Uh, instead of one business occupying the main floor on the first floor, like uh, Bondi and Johnston did, you have several stores now. It's broken up. I think there's like three or possibly four stores there at that time. In 1905, the owner of the building, Mr. Howard, died, and Frank Jenks purchased the property from the heirs of Mr. Howard and became known as the Jinx Block for decades. This photograph also gives you a good look at Ronald's Jewelry Store there. And you can see, much like uh, uh, Bossiers used to have their clock planted on the sidewalk out front, uh, Ronald's Jewelry had theirs uh, hanging from the building. And you can see it here as we zoom in. For over a half a century, this block consisted of two buildings, the Jinx Building, and then there was the building on the north end of the block which anchored it. And uh, in this photo that we looked at previously, you can see this is the first building that anchored the north end of the block. Up until that time, it was a vacant lot. For much of the life of this building, it was used as a bank. Although there were short periods of time, it was used for other things such as a drugstore or uh, a hotel. And I've never seen a, a photograph of this uh, building close up, just far away like this one is. Until uh, this past week, I came across this in the Times-Herald archives. And, 
I was pretty amazed at seeing it because I had never seen it before. And I actually have a photograph of the inside of this building, although I didn't realize it until this past week when I was doing my research. This is where the uh, Bricker Drugstore was, the first one. The second one was on the uh, corner where Woolworths would be, the, the northeast corner of Huron Avenue and uh, Grand River. In 1903, that first anchor building was going to come down and they were going to put up a new anchor building, the First National Exchange Bank. This newspaper article said, New Bank Building, Plans Completed for the First National Bank Structure. And it goes on and said, It would be built on the present site of the Bricker Drugstore. In August of 1903, this article appeared in the paper. First National Exchange Bank this old reliable financial institution building a fine home of its own. Description of the new structure with a history of the bank. And this is the article that I found a picture of the first building that was on the north end of the block. As we scroll down here, you can see it. This newspaper article did more than just show me a photograph that I was glad to get of that first building. It also answered uh, a mystery for me. Maybe I should say resolved a mystery for me that I hadn't been able to figure out until uh, that time that I saw this. And that is, where was this building at? I always believed that this building here was on that corner. Even though I couldn't find a photograph of the building, I could only find this drawing of the building. Also, I could never find anything in the uh, Times-Herald archive showing that a hotel was being built there around that time. But when I saw this picture, this is what the caption says. The old building recently torn down to make way for the new First National Exchange Bank building. So that there tells me that there was never a hotel there that was built, a brand new hotel. I believe that uh, the owner decided uh, to move to that location. I think his plans was to build a brand new hotel there. But for some reason, it never transpired. He was only there about three years. And then he moved from there to the northeast uh, corner of Bard and Huron Avenue. Of course, that building is no longer there. But in this photograph of a parade, you can see it in the background. Uh, this was the old city uh, hotel that later became uh, McCormick Hotel. But in this photograph, it was a recruitment center. You can see the signage on the side. But most of us remember when it was the Elias Chop House. And you can see that uh, this was a bigger building than the uh, building that was on, an, on the corner of Huron Avenue and Quay. And so it made uh, sense for him to move out of that smaller building into this larger building, since he didn't build the hotel. Now, I'm sure this doesn't interest most of you, but just in case there's a historian buff out there, I thought uh, I would show it to you. This is a great photo of the uh, Jinx building. It shows the uh, different uh, stores in there. You can see the United Cigar uh, store on the left in the new section there. You can see the uh, second uh, northern anchor of the block. Uh, earlier, it was in the same block only south of where it would be located later. That's First National Exchange Bank. And then next to that was Reynolds uh, Jewelry Store. And you can see uh, their clock hanging out uh, over the building, or over the sidewalk, I should say. And actually, it looks more like a pocket watch than it does a clock. So I think that's what it's supposed to be. I used this photograph in an uh, earlier video, I think maybe it was 27, when I was uh, focusing on the, the uh, bank. And uh, I said the location was on the uh, northwest corner of Quay and Huron Avenue, which would be false. This is the Jinx building in the block that we've been looking at. But back then, I mean, that was years ago. I was just a kid. I was probably in my early 70s. And so, uh, you know, it was my first mistake I ever made in my life, so you have to cut me a little bit of slack. 
I just want a full disclosure so that you would know exactly where this building was. October 17, 1904, disappeared in the paper. Handsome quarters, over 4,000 people, visited the new First National Exchange Bank on Saturday afternoon and evening. And uh, I'll just read you a little bit of it. Floors of electric light showed off the elegant mahogany finishings and furniture and elaborate decorations. The visitor first entered the lobby, the ceiling of which is finished in Roman design. The floor is covered with interlocking rubber tiling and is noiseless. The ladies' reception room was next visited. It is handsomely furnished, contains a desk, writing material, lavatory, and full-length mirror. The director's room is in the rear of the building. It is complete in every respect. A long mahogany table occupies the center of the room, surrounded by massive chairs. The ceiling and walls being finished with hand-painted tapestry. On the walls hung portraits of the late D.B. Harrington and John Miller, the first president and cashier of the bank. Above a mantel hung a golden frame containing pictures of the deceased directors. The two large burglar-proof vaults with their time locks next attracted attention. One will be used for holding money and the other for safety deposits. These vaults are the best made. I was surprised to see they had time locks on their vaults back in 1904. Passing the vaults, the visitors were permitted to inspect the offices of the president and cashier and the wire cages for the tellers, bookkeepers, and other employees. The ladies who passed through President Barnum's office were presented with carnations. The electric light and gas fixtures are massive and handsome. The new building is located on the same corner where Miller and Son conducted their private bank for several years and where the present bank received its original charter. I have a couple of colored drawings of that bank um, that was done for an architectural class. Now the first one is the daylight version, and this one here is the nighttime version. I think it gives you a pretty neat perspective on the bank. I told you this open house of the bank was October 17th, 1904, in that newspaper. But uh, that was a Monday paper. Sunday's paper I don't have if there was one. So Monday's paper would cover Saturday and Sunday. So this event took place on Saturday, but there was another event that took place on Sunday. This was on page eight, but on page one was much more dramatic because there was a fire in that block on Sunday night that also damaged this new bank. $20,000 fire in Port Huron started in the basement of Jinx Block, damage caused chiefly by smoke and water. I'll let you read this at your leisure, but it gives you a list of the estimated losses and uh, where the losses occurred uh, with businesses and offices and so forth. Keep in mind that $20,000 in 1904 would be like $600,000 today, so uh, it was nothing to sneeze at. This was only the first of three fires that was in the Jinx block that I know of, and we'll look at the next two in our next video. So join me then.